Dustin, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the idea behind Hinge. Why did you found this company? Well, I started it in 2011, so this is kind of pre-dating app craze, dating app era, and really just because I was at business school, and uh, I, I'd grown up just like being a total crazy party kid. <laughs> and when I graduated college, like the day I graduated, I, I like quit drinking, quit doing like wow. all my crazy life, put that as behind me. And when I was in business school, I was back to a party environment. I didn't want to take part in that. And so I was just having trouble meeting new people. And the only things that were out there were these like clunky websites with screen names. And like, it was just like a very antiquated, uh, uh, the online dating world was very antiquated. And no one my age you know, people in their 20s would use dating services. Like, that was yeah. weird. And so the idea was to create something really simple and elegant that would be on your mobile phone that would allow you to connect with people using your real name, using your existing social profiles. So that was the, that was the original idea behind, behind Hinge. Yeah. What was the biggest challenge? You mentioned that there was something in the space, but it was clunky. It wasn't really for people your age. It was kind of antiquated. It didn't feel kind of web native, or at least not definitely not mobile native. Right. Um, what were the biggest challenges in creating something that people were actually going to use who were you know, in their 20s or 30s? I mean, the big... The really big innovation was just like the one-click sign-on. Any of you who have used or know about like the Tinders or Bumbles of the world. And so we started about the same time as, as Tinder did. And that was it. I mean, you just had to make it so simple that it's like, why wouldn't you do it? And, and the, inno the innovation there was that you would just make it like a photo and you just put it there and you could like swipe left or right and then you would get a match and it was fun and, and then you, you just like get all this activity and it was totally novel, spread like crazy. Uh, but I think that was the real thing that actually tipped it was just to like distill the experience into this like very bite-sized, simple, uh, you know, superficial, like fun, yeah. gamified experience. Yeah. And you said spread like crazy. I'm wondering to what extent were you prepared for the absolute boom that was about to happen in the kind of mobile app dating market? I've... I mean, I believed it because I just technology was coming. We're all using the internet more and more. We're moving to our mobile phones, and dating is just like one of the most like ubiquitous like thing. We all go through it at, at some point in our lives, and it was just crazy to me that no, like pe the people who were single weren't using these platforms. So I would go, and I was trying to raise capital at the time, and I talked to venture capitalists and. Um, and they're like, yo, ma like match.com like owns this world. Like nothing's <laughs> ever gonna like beat it. There's no, like this market's totally saturated. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm like, no, literally none of my single friends are using this. This cannot possibly be saturated. And I'm like, oh, well, young people don't pay. People don't pay on mobile. And it was just like a different world. And, but you know, if you, if you look at the long view, clearly this is where this was going to go. So it really, it's not that surprising at all. And you mentioned some other, we don't need to dwell on competitors, but <laughs> what is the thing that as other things were cropping up that made you think, okay, here's how I'm going to make Hinge different from these other things that are now cropping up and also spreading in the market? Hinge started as this friends of friends dating app. So it was, it was plugged into Facebook and you would connect with people that were your, the people that you would eventually meet at a house party or a dinner or a wedding or something like that. And then, um, but we wanted to make it I think the innovation at that time was just make it fun, simple, easy. Uh, and then some of these other ones came out that just exploded. Like Tinder, obviously, like exploded and went global in a period of about 18 months. And, uh, and what became apparent is that um, this was a fun like game, but in terms of effectiveness at actually helping people find their person, it was, it was not so good. So by 2015, I went to my team and I said, I think we should just start over. Let's like scrap this entire thing. Let's rebuild it from scratch and let's create a service for people who are looking for uh, deeper connection and really want a relationship. And how would you design that service? And so we kind of like did a complete U-turn from what we were doing. And instead of focusing on engagement and time and app and retention and all these sorts of um, metrics that we would use that today Instagram and Facebook and all these types of services use, we actually like made our metric, this seems so simple in retrospect, uh, great dates. <laughs> like how many great dates are we actually setting up every single week? And banking that our long-term success would come from um, uh, effectiveness and people spreading the word about us instead of like addictiveness and sort of uh, the shock of just how crazy this experience is. 
Yeah. So it seems like you have kind of a decent trove of data on how people are using Hinge, how people are dating, who, who they're meeting maybe. What are the things that you've learned from the data that you've collected on the people who are using the app? So, my, so, we, so our tagline as a company is that we're the app that's designed to be deleted. We don't want you using our app and we want you out on great days as soon as possible. <laughs> and so everything that we do, just like other companies that I think will use the data, I don't want to say against you, but basically against you, right? But basically, like, how do we, like, okay, we've got your attention. How do we, like, keep you here for longer? How do we, like, and this is not what you signed up for. You didn't sign up to Facebook to, like, just stare at a screen for six hours a day. You presumably signed up to, like, connect with your friends. But that's not, I believe, how most people feel that the, the experience when they put down the phone after browsing Facebook. And uh, so that has led to all kinds of innovation. I mean, first of all, just the fact that we ask about dates and, and uh, when people exchange phone numbers and then feed that data back into our algorithm to try to figure out what works. Um, little things about how to keep the conversation going, how to start the conversation in the first place, how to make people more selective so that our machine learning gets way better. Like on the swiping apps, you swipe right, like guys will swipe right like 70% of the time, right? 70% of the time. So what, like, what am I ever going to learn about your taste if you say you like 70% of people? If I took you like down the street at like restaurants and you told me you like 70% of restaurants, I would have like, how would I ever begin to tell you what type of food you like? And so by making, uh, so on Hinge, for example, we don't have the swiping. We have this thing where people post uh, answers to questions and uh, they'll post photos with captions and people can like an individual piece of content. And when they do that, um, it starts the conversation because you actually have a point of context, not just, oh, you guys liked each other, but, oh, this is what someone liked about me. And it takes that from like 70% down to like 15%. And now, okay, now we actually have information about who you like and who you don't like. We can zero people in on their match much better. We have things like, I'll just, I can keep going forever. I mean, <laughs> the, that's why we say we're designed to be deleted yeah. because there's like so many pieces of it. We have the most compatible feature where each day, you know, we try to help you cut through the clutter and find the right person for you. So this, this yeah. is all the kind of stuff that we're doing to make technology work for you and not you work for the technology companies. Yeah. So maybe about a year or two ago, I did a survey of all my friends and I asked them who has... Who out of this group has ever used a dating app and who is using a dating app almost exclusively to go on dates? And excluding the small group of us who met our partners literally like right before the dating app craze hit, every single one of my friends uses apps almost exclusively to meet and go on dates. There was no one who said that like in the last year they had met somebody at a bar organically and gone on a date with them. And I was really, really blown away by that. So I'm wondering if you can talk to me about whether or not you think that technology has fundamentally changed the way people meet, date, and fall in love. Because I think one of the things that's really interesting about Hinge is everything you just described to me kind of mimics what you would have if you went to a house party and met somebody really great and went home excited about them and exchanged numbers and then went on a date in a non-technology-based way. So on the surface, it's kind of like, has it, has it really fundamentally changed dating? Like I can tell you that like, we're still people. <laughs> we're still people that are going on dates and that's fundamentally the same. Um, I think it's kind of like, you know, we used to hail taxis and now we call Ubers. Like it makes it way easier. You use it way more often. It becomes the predominant way that you travel when you, even when you live in a place like New York and, uh, or, or Boston probably. And so uh, I think it's changed in that way, but, but it, it is, that is starting to shape how people uh, are dating out there, I think. People are waiting longer. That was already a trend, but I think that's really a trend now because people are, um, they don't have to, well, I'll even back up and say, we, this is whole, this has sort of been like a step through emotions, I think, here about fee, like the anger and outrage and everything people are talking about. But I think we've gone from a, a world of like where dating was sort of based around fear to where it's based around greed in a way. Like it used to be like you didn't, like you were so afraid that you weren't going to find someone and you found someone who was like halfway decent. And you're like, oh, like, okay, like this is, I'm going to like, you know, this is my person. Like, let's settle down. Let's figure it out. And I think now people have like an access to so many people and that makes it, um, on the other end, people can feel like, oh, I just have to wait for that right, like that perfect person. Like, oh, this person has like this one thing wrong with them. So, you know, maybe I'll, I'll just keep swiping. I'll find the next person. So I think that mentality shift has changed. Uh, Do you think that's concerning at all? I, it, I think it's a trade off either way. Like, I think what's really wonderful that I've seen is like, um, people, especially, 
I, I, I feel like I heard this a lot anecdotally that people who are in bad marriages are not afraid to leave because they know that there's now a way for them to like find another person again. And I don't think that that was the way that it was. I think when you look at um, in, like uh, LGBTQ people and their ability to find people, if you look at interracial, like all these things are increasing and it's the result of, of having a more like open, we'll say efficient dating market. And I think that that's really great, but there are downsides to it. And I think that now I think the courageous decision is, which I think is a very romantic decision to decide like, okay, I know I have, there's a lot of choice out there, but I like, I want to choose you and I want to like go into uh, a deep relationship with you. And ultimately that's where, that's where like, obviously the magic happens. It's not about finding like the perfect right person. It's yeah. about like the connection you build and develop with another person. I want to take a break to let the audience know that we're going to come to you for questions. So if you still have Slido up, that is how you can submit your questions. I have a few more, um, and then we will go to the audience. So it has been said that you do not have email on your phone. Is that true? Yeah, I don't have email. I don't have Slack. I don't have social media accounts. Uh, none of it. So this is this blows my mind because when I got off stage about 20 minutes ago, I ran back and sent off 15 emails and 3,000 slacks, something like that. Um, <laughs> but one of the things we've been talking about all day is kind of learning what the healthy relationship with your phones, with technology in general is. And I think the idea that somebody who has created a tech company has created these boundaries for themselves around the technology that they also use for work is kind of mind-blowing. Can you talk about how you think about creating those boundaries? I think about it, I mean, I've done what's worked for me over time, and I started to cut these things out. I never really was attracted to Facebook or Instagram. I didn't, honestly, I didn't really get it. Uh, and, but even things like email or Slack, like I just find myself compulsively checking it when I'm trying to like hang out with my wife and like I'm like pulling out my phone every time there's a little notification and, and then I'm like context switching all the time. It's just the quality of my life and the quality of my relationships just starts taking a total nosedive. I've even blocked myself at this point from the New York Times and Washington Post and Real Clear Politics because like I'll even check those types of things compulsively. And my wife literally like took my phone and we like put, she put in the code so I couldn't even like unblock myself across like all my devices. So I don't even, I have no idea what's going on in the world, but I'm so much happier. And, <laughs> and um, no, I really am. I, I, I'm like not kidding because the, uh, you just have to feel it. Like go on a 30 day detox or you just have to feel it. But I just sitting around when we're all on our phones talking about like what a healthy relationship with technology looks like is like sitting around a crack house being like, what do you think like a, like a healthy relationship with like drugs would look like? And <laughs> I just, um, I just not, uh, it's, we're so far over the line of what a healthy relationship with technology looks like. I think it looks like using technology that is designed to uh, uh, extend you and empower you. Like, I think Uber, I think Spotify, like, these are great pieces of technology. They're incredible. They're not designed to keep me sucked in the app. They're designed to, like, allow me to live a big, bigger, fuller life where, like, I want to travel across town and I can do it easier and faster, and that's amazing. But things that are actually designed where, where I'm the product <laughs> being sold to something else, I don't like, I don't want to engage with that at all. Yeah. You mentioned your wife and you two have a really interesting love story. And since we were talking about dating and love and the idea of being able to kind of move off the app and into real life with those relationships, can you share with our audience kind of the path that you had through dating and marriage? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been a journey. So uh, how do I describe it? I, it's so intertwined with the story of Hinge because, so I, Kate and I started dating uh, her first day of college. So I was 19, she was 18. It was 16 years ago. Uh, and we dated on and off through college. But like I said, I was a little bit of a crazy party kid and getting her into trouble. And, uh, and so we split ways at the end of college. I was like, please save yourself. And <laughs> no, I really though, I was yeah. insane. And so <laughs> we'd broken up like seven times and uh, so we did and then um, four years later I'd like gotten my life together like I said I like stopped drinking stopped doing drugs like the day I graduated from college and uh, I so I, I reached out to her and I was like you know I'm in, going to Harvard Business School now and I've like got my life together do you want to get back together and she said no and I <laughs> she didn't really trust me anymore she was living uh, abroad in London with someone else and I was totally heartbroken. That's when I started Hinge. 
fast forward four more years, I don't I'll take, I'll take this, have this story take forever, but fast forward <laughs> four more years, and um, someone who'd met on Hinge wanted to do an interview with me who, for an article for the New York Times. And at the end of the interview, she asked if I'd ever been in love. And I said, well, once a long time ago, but I didn't recognize it until it was too late. And she had this reciprocal story and she, she's like, listen, and she's like, you know, where is she now? And she was living in Switzerland about to marry this other guy. And she's like, you have to like, like you have to do something about it. You have to like make a gesture. And long story short, I flew to Switzerland uh, and <laughs> there's like obviously a lot more context here, but uh, I flew to Switzerland and asked her to call for a wedding and move back to America with me, which she did. And <laughs> that like, <laughs> obviously there's more to it than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I would tell you the whole story, but that would be like a whole other interview. Uh, and <laughs> so, um, but then she came back and I started to figure out what a real relationship was like. And it wasn't about finding that perfect person. Like the, the reason I held out for Kate is because I had this illusion that like, oh, like you just have to find that perfect person. And Kate was my perfect person. I'm never going to find my perfect person again. And that's why I have to start this dating app to find, like go through millions of women in order to find the perfect person. And what I found is that it was about like the vulnerability and the connection, the opening up and like we've had, you know, it was the first like real relationship that I'd ever had, honestly. And it was, it had all kinds of ups and downs. It wasn't a fairy tale, but uh, it's been incredible. And I think that that ethos is then what infused into the app and made me want to like completely reboot the experience and change it from this swipey app to this thing that really helped people connect. And so she's very much like the muse yeah. <laughs> of Hinge. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. Um, let's go to the audience for question. So we have one from Nick. Do you imagine a day when you download a dating app and don't do any searching? The algorithm already knows who your best match is. And is that a good idea? I think we're getting better at that. I think we're getting pretty close. In fact, that person who um, I wrote that article about me that inspired me to like go to Switzerland is the very first person that showed up on her screen. They matched uh, and um, the rest is history there. So. Uh, I, but I think that you always are going to need that, like, that in-person exchange. Like, yeah. we're all about getting people, people only spend six minutes a day on Hinge. It's because we want you off the app, out on great dates so that you can actually feel what the connection looks like. And there's just like, there's so many aspects of that. And I, I think in theory, if we could get all the information in the world and plug it in, we could figure it out, but we're not like practically, that's yeah. not anytime soon. All right, let's take another one from Sarah. Do you think that technology and dating apps enable us to improve the quality or depth of relationships we have with each other, or does it just affect the scope? I think that could be used to, to help people. I think there are apps out there that actually try to help that. What I think is cool about Hinge is that, for example, the prompts that we have are designed to help you get out on successful first dates. And we give you more context about a person than you would meet if you like met them out at a bar. We ask people to share about their hopes and dreams and fears and <laughs> things like that that you just people don't wear on their sleeves. And so I think that that's a really cool to it's it's scope, but it's also like a little bit of depth to make sure that you're you're really getting to see a sense of each person that you're going through. Yeah. All right, we have another one. For an app that's designed to be deleted, how does Hinge make money? Are Hinge users the product? Hinge users are not the product. So we make money because we, we charge our users, uh, a percentage of them for upgraded features, but that's the way we make money. So you are the customer when you're at Hinge. And um, yeah, and we make money because we grow because people go and tell their friends that they met on Hinge. Right now we have a presidential candidate, Pete Buttigieg, who <laughs> met his husband on Hinge and is telling like the whole world that he met his husband on Hinge. How thrilled we're, were you about that? We're like so <laughs> thrilled. I mean, I can't say that I'm supporting him for, for president, but I can't say I'm not. It'd be really good for business. And I, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, we've seen a huge spike, especially in, in gay men uh, signing up to Hinge, which has been like incredible. All right. Well, everyone, please join me in thanking Justin. Thank you.